We have been studying through family relationships. I started at the beginning, and as much as we know about the beginning, being Genesis 1 and 2, the creation, we talked about God creating man, and then being unique in all of creation, because you know man is the only creation that God did in those six days where God only made one. Everything else he said, he made the birds, he made the fish, he made the animals that creep along the ground, he, he made batches of them, but man he made unique, he made them singular. And then no suitable helper was found for him. Um, we were on an island off of Roatan, and there was a small animal sanctuary there, and they had uh, some jaguars, and, and they had a bunch of capuchin monkeys, and some other kind of monkeys that, that uh, were, were not very pleasant to look at. And they had all kinds of beautiful macaws and parrots and, and birds, and one of the macaws um, actually spoke English, but only if you said something to it in Spanish. And um, it, my brother, um, he, he is he's getting pretty good at his Spanish. I don't understand why when he speaks Spanish, though, he sounds like Speedy Rodriguez. His, his whole voice changes, and he goes from speaking in a normal English voice to, hey, man, what do you want to do with this in Spanish? And it's like, why are you doing that? Don't you think that might be insulting to them? And he's not even aware he's doing it. And so he walks by this, this macaw, and he's like, uh, hola! And it started talking to him in English. Like, Whoa, cool. Well, my, my sister-in-law is very much afraid of animals. <laughs> um, she's afraid of sloths. So if that tells you anything, you know, sloths. She is absolutely convinced that the sloth is going to jump out of the tree and attack her. Okay? Well, there were iguanas on this island. And they were walking down by this parrot, or this macaw, and somebody had said something about an iguana off the trail. Well, they needed to go past there to get where they were going, and, and so she's kind of... <coughs> and the macaw behind her lets out this shriek. <laughs> Run! <laughs> Run! <laughs> she was gone. Now, part of that was set up because of a previous incident. Um, my brother Todd is a photographer, and, and he takes some beautiful, beautiful pictures. And he had his camera, and they were taking pictures of the capuchin monkeys. Well, we had noticed when we first got there, one of the capuchin monkeys was out. Um, she had gotten out about two weeks before, and they were not able to catch her to put her back in the cage. Evidently, she was something of an escape artist. Well, Todd's taking pictures of this cage, and then he looks up, and he realizes this capuchin is on the outside of the cage. He's like, oh, that's cool. I'm going to get a picture, you know. And he goes over and starts taking pictures. Well, the capuchin starts coming at him. And he's taking pictures, and it's getting closer, and pictures, and it's getting closer. And, and then it was kind of like one of those things off of like monkey shines or uh, uh, something like uh, out of a horror novel because that monkey's looking at him, and it's about as far from me to Chris away from him. And it looks at him and it goes, <laughs> and it took off after it. So he's, he's taking pictures, and he's got one picture with the monkey looking at him, and the next picture, the monkey's all freaked out and coming closer. So he's backing up, and he's backing up, and this thing keeps chasing him. He finally turned around and ran. Well, he was with my younger brother, Keith, and his wife, Todd's wife, Melissa, and he turned around, they were gone. They're all the way down the end of the thing already. So if you ask Todd, if you ever get a medium, ask him about getting attacked by El Chupacaba, because he, he, he insists that's El Chupacaba. Now, the whole point of that, I, I didn't seg I segued intentionally into the stories about the trip because I was thinking about that capuchin monkey. Now, you can train capuchin monkeys to do a lot of things. Um, you remember the old organ grinders, the guys would stand and they turn and the monkey would have a little hat and they'd hold a cup and you can train them to do a lot of things. Chimpanzees, you can train to do even more things. You can actually train uh, chimpanzees and, and apes to communicate via sign, sign language. And, um, by the way, this is not sign language, this is just um, kind of pent-up energy leaving my body. So, um, but when God was looking through all the creatures, and as he was bringing them to Adam to name, he realized there was no suitable helper. The 
ape was not sufficient, the chimpanzee was not sufficient, the capuchin was not sufficient, del chupacabra was not sufficient. There needed to be something else. And so God took the unique creation of man that was the only one that we know of that was created individually, singularly, without others, and he took from man and made woman. Okay? Another absolutely unique creation because she is the only one that we know of that was taken out of a living thing to make a new living thing. Okay, so we, we've looked at how God uh, intended that they would steward his earth, that they would take care of it, that, that they were to rule over it. Um, we looked as, as to how that was played out, and, and that's chapters 1 and chapter 2, and then we get to chapter 3. Now, we don't know how much time transpired between 2 and 3. But we know there was enough time that God would come in the cool of the evening and walk in the garden with us and Eve. Okay? So we know some time transpired, and then the serpent comes in and he gets Eve to eat of the fruit. Um, by the way, you know that, that most scholars think that the fruit that they actually ate was probably a pomegranate? I don't know why. Um, quite honestly, I think it's a fruit that we've never seen and we won't see till we get to heaven and we see the actual you know, well, we won't see the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, but we'll see the tree of life. But they, they think it was possibly a pomegranate. And I'm, I'm thinking, who's going to look at that and think, oh, here, bite. Bite. Yeah, yeah. no. Okay. Um, but sin comes in. Okay. And, and the creation that God said was very good is no longer very good. As a matter of fact, we see as God comes to walk with Adam and Eve, they're hiding from him. They've covered themselves with, with vegetation. And um, he calls out to them and says, Adam, where are you? Now, he's not saying, Adam, where are you? Because God doesn't know. He wants Adam to come to him. This is something, this is a key component that you need to understand about God. When the enemy comes against you and he accuses you and he condemns you, God is going to come searching for you. And he's coming to search for you because he wants fellowship with you. Thankfully, we are on this side of the cross so that when God comes searching for us, we can come to him and, and he is just and able to forgive our sins if we confess them. <clears throat> okay? But God was seeking out Adam and Eve. He was looking for them. He wanted to be with them. So he's not calling out, where are you? Because he doesn't know where Adam is. I mean, who wants to play hide and seek with God? You know? Um, so Adam and Eve come out and God basically wants them to say what's happened. Uh, you know, as a parent, I certainly understand it. As a grandparent, I watch it going on with my grandchildren and I, I watch as my children are parenting and, and the, you can tell they know exactly what happened, but they want the kid to confess. They want the kid to acknowledge what went on, okay? And so we see this curse that, that comes in. The serpent is cursed. It will... Uh, forever slither on its belly. It will be at enmity with the woman and their offspring will be at enmity. And, and uh, scripture, in the midst of this curse, God gives a promise, uh, the promise of the Messiah to come. He says that uh, as the serpent will bite his heel, so the offspring, offspring, the seed being singular, not plural, the, the, the offspring of Eve will bruise his head. Now, in that, there's a, a little tidbit that we need to catch right there because in this curse, God gives a promise and a prophecy and he also specifies about the virgin birth because he says nothing about the offspring being of man. He says the offspring will be of the woman, okay? not man. So even at this point, God already knows what's going on. He's, he's already got a plan that's in play and, and so God's not taken off guard. Well, then uh, he, he turns to the woman, and, and the woman is cursed because of sin. Uh, she will have pain in childbirth. Um, we talked a little bit about um, the passage, the verse that says, her desire will be for her husband, and he will rule over, over her. And, um, you know, the, it's believed by the way the Hebrew is written that it is not a desire for her husband like she wants to be with her husband. It's a desire for her husband's position, that she wants to rule over her husband. And when you look in the way the story is laid out, that's exactly what the sin was, wasn't it? It was Eve wanting to elevate herself beyond what she was. 
Now, Adam, I think his sin was different. I don't think that Adam really gave a whole lot of thought about being above or below. I think Adam just followed his wife. I think she committed a sin out of a desire to be more than she was, and he did not stand up and do what he was supposed to do. He was supposed to protect her. He was supposed to be caretaking of her and the animals. And, and if Adam saw the serpent coming in and, and telling them to do something, that the one thing that God told them not to do, Adam should have been the first one to say, uh-huh, out. Out. We will have no commerce with you. We will have no conversation with you. We will not abide your presence out. Okay? Because he was given that authority. He was put in charge of all of creation. He didn't do that, did he? No. His wife said, oh, here, this is good. Eat. And he went, oh, okay. And he ate. Now, um, in this, this curse, um, we see the striving from the very first marriage. We see the striving of a broken relationship between man and woman, husband and wife. Okay? We have never got to see it work properly because we're so far removed from the garden. We've, I've seen good marriages. I've seen some incredibly good marriages. I've seen some pretty lousy, rotten marriages, too. And I've seen a lot of marriages, as a matter of fact, the most of them, that vacillate somewhere between the two. Okay? There are times when Christy and I, our, our marriage was horrible. It was terrible. And there are times when our marriage is, is fantastic. But most of the time, it balances somewhere between the two. Okay? So we see this, this curse uh, as a result of sin. There will be friction. There will be tension. There will be a contest, a contesting between husband and wife. Okay? And God turns around to man, and, and he curses man. Now, um, we have been working through uh, the series as Genesis History and Brothers Meeting. And it was so funny because about... Well, I've been working on these notes for about two years. Uh, about, about a month and a half ago, I was actually working over this part of the message, uh, The Curse of the Man, and, and we got to the, the part of the book last night, and it was basically reiterating everything that I want to tell you about the curse of Adam and, and how it affected him. Because it says, uh, if you have your Bible, open to Genesis 3. I want to read just real quickly, and then I want to get into some of the brokenness and how that looks. So we can be on our guard. So Genesis chapter 3, verse 17. This is God speaking. And to Adam he said, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife, and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Now, why is God upset with Adam? Disobeyed. Yeah, he disobeyed. But he lists two reasons right here. They, they amount to one and the same thing, but there's two different sides to this. The first thing is he listened to his wife in opposition to what God had said. Wives, you have an incredible amount of sway over your husband. I, I do not like it when Christy is unhappy. It bothers me when something is bothering her. Okay. Um, very few things will get me going much more quickly than somebody messing with my wife. Okay. Um, I want her to be happy. Now she's she is a much more even killed person than I am, and she's uh, she deals a lot better in joy than I do. I'm still trying to work out how that's supposed to look. Um, you know the, the you know they say that you use twice as many muscles to frown as you do to smile. Um, I have worked out a lot in my life on my face muscles. Okay, I, I have a look a lot of times like I'm I'm irritated or unhappy with things and. I, I, I see my, my eyebrows are kind of like that right now, aren't they? I don't even know it. I don't even know that that's happening. And a lot of times somebody will take a picture that I'm not aware of. I'm doing something else and I'll look at my face and I'll think, I wasn't unhappy there. I 
wasn't angry, I wasn't upset, and I asked Christy a couple weeks ago, is that really what I look like? Most of the time, is that what I look like? And she said, yeah, pretty much all the time. <laughs> wow. So if you see me like this, this is not angry. I don't know what this is. I mean, this is just gravity asserting itself over my eyebrows or something, I don't know. But women, you have an incredible sway over the men in your lives. First, over your husbands, and then over your children, okay? So, and we're gonna touch on that more in a little bit. But God is uh, cursing, he's laying out the curse for Adam, and he says, because you listened to the voice of your wife, and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it, cursed is the ground because of you. Now think about this for a moment. All of creation suffers under the curse because of what Adam did. Because of what Adam did. Not Eve. Adam. The ground is cursed because of what Adam did. Death comes because of what Adam did. Now we know in the New Testament, uh, Paul writes that, that it was Eve that was deceived, not Adam. And that makes it worse for Adam, because he wasn't deceived. He knew full well what was going on and did it anyway. But it was through Adam that the curse came to all of creation, to all of mankind. Okay? Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. Okay, you listen to this picture because you read, look in chapter 2 when God is creating man and he gives him his commission and he puts him in charge of things. None of this comes through in that. Adam doesn't have to work for the land to produce for him. He is working. He is busy about what the master has given him to do. He is caretaking. He is shepherding. But he's not having to toil. We really don't understand that. Because for us, work in some way is always toil. The ground is cursed. He's going to only feed himself through pain. Verse 19, by the sweat of your face, you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of the ground you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Okay? Because of man, and, and we see... Uh, this again in the New Testament in the Pauline epistles because Adam sinned death came into the world uh, as a matter of fact that we see uh, when Paul is writing he, he actually holds Adam up as a type so that he can hold up hold up Jesus as another type as through Adam all men sin because of the sin of the one man through Jesus Christ there is salvation all because of his salvation because of, of, of what he has done. And so uh, we see this curse. Everything now on the earth is suffering. Suffering because of man's sin. I, I mean, think about that for a moment. You know, we, we know that in the end times that the, uh, the lion and the lamb and the wolf and the asp and all of those will work together in harmony and, and they'll lay down together. And I mean, think about this for a moment. We don't know how quickly the curse went into effect. We don't. But just imagine a lamb laying down snuggling a lion. And then the lion goes, hmm, yum, yum. <laughs> but I, that, that's kind of a silly thought. But think about how drastic that is from the original intent, the original design. Because God says that all of the creatures were given the vegetation for food. And now, lambs, they don't know who to trust. You know? Chickens. Cows. They, they don't know, because now, a lot of the things that they just used to hang out with and pal around with are looking to eat them. All of creation is twisted. So, Let's, let's talk about this for a moment. Um, I'm going to start with women, but please don't take offense because we will get to men as well. Um, 
still. We talked about um, her desire shall be uh, with contention for her husband. A, a couple of examples that, that come to mind. Uh, one of the stories that always kind of amazes me. It speaks to the goodness of God, his greatness, but also speaks of his mercy. Um, God chose Abram out of all the people of the earth that through him he might bless all the nations of the earth. He chose Abram. And then he gave a promise to Abram that he and his wife would have descendants that would be as numerous as the sands of the earth and the stars in the heaven. Okay. Well, in Genesis, uh, I think it's about chapter 18. Uh, let's, let's turn there real quick. Um, let's see. 16, not 18. Genesis 16. I went through the better part of three weeks with not a single day of dry mouth. But as soon as the music starts playing for church, my mouth gets dry. <clears throat> so in, in chapter 16, Genesis, um, we see that Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children, but she had a, an Egyptian servant whose name was Hagar. Well, Sarah, Sarai, says, uh, I, 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 we need to get things moving here. And so I don't understand this culture because this is not our culture. But evidently this was not unusual because we see it happening multiple times. So Rai goes to Abram and says, uh, yeah, yeah, things aren't happening with me. So here, take my, my servant and, and lie with her that you might have a child, that we might have a child. And so Abram, what does he do? He does, who's he listening to? His wife. And what comes out of this? The entire contention in the Middle East today. Okay? So Abram goes, oh, okay. Okay. And Hagar gets pregnant. Now, verse 4, it says, And he went into Hagar, and she conceived, and when she saw that she had conceived, she looked with contempt on her mistress. Now, 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 let's look what happens in, in verse 5. This is one of those things that just amazes me. And Sarai said to Abram, May the wrong done to me be on you. I gave my servant to your embrace, and when she saw that she had conceived, she looked on me with contempt. May the Lord judge between you and me. Now, think about this for a moment. What should Abram have done? God had promised that he was going to use him to, to build a nation for himself, and then that nation, through that nation, he would bless all the nations of the world. What should Abram have done? Oh, don't whisper. He should have waited and trust God. He should have believed that what God said was going to happen was going to happen. The exact same thing that Adam failed to do in the garden. God told him, hey, don't eat of this because the day you eat of this, you will die. Adam knew better. Abram knew better. And then Sarai's mad at him. He can't win for losing. So Abram, he says, oh, yo, I'm out. You guys take care of this between you. I'm out of this. I don't want... Mm -mm. I'm going to go out with the sheep and the goats where it's quiet. Then Sarai dealt heartily, which harshly with her, being Hagar, and she fled from her. And then we see um, the, the promise that is given to Hagar. Because she bore a son for Abram, even though that was not God's intent, that was not God's desire, that was not God's plan, God knew it was going to happen, and he gave a promise to her as well that her son, Ishmael, would be the father of another mighty nation. Okay? And, and that happened. Okay? Let's, let's look at a couple other passages that I just want to point out to you. Um, Esther, chapter 1. 
Um, Esther is a unique book in, in the scripture because, uh, does anybody know why? God's not in it. Uh, the name of God, the word God, is never used in the book of Esther. Okay. Chapter 1, I'm not going to I'm not gonna read it. You have opportunity this week. I would encourage you to go back and take a look at this. Uh, King Ahasuerus is throwing a party, and it's a huge shindy. And, and he's, I mean, this thing is going on for days. And his queen, Vashti, she is also throwing a party in, in another part of the capital. And uh, on the seventh day, when the king, uh, when the heart of the king was merry with wine, He gives you orders to bring Queen Vashti so that everybody can look at her because she was of great beauty. She refused. Okay? Um, she told the king no. Now, we know the story. The king sought counsel. He was upset. He, he looks for counsel as to what he should do with Queen Vashti. But I want to draw particular attention to what this counselor says to him. Uh, verse 16 uh, <clears throat> says, Then Memucan said in the presence of the king and the officials, Not only against the king has Queen Vashti done wrong, but also against all the officials and all the peoples who are in all the provinces of King Ahasuerus. For the queen's behavior will be made known to all women, causing them to look at their husbands with contempt. Since they will say, King Ahasuerus commanded Queen Vashti to be brought before him, and she did not come. This very day, the noble women of Persia and Media, who have heard the queen's behavior, will say the same to all the king's officials, and there will be contempt and wrath in plenty. I don't know about you guys, but Mimukan seems to me to be making a mountain out of a molehill except that this very perfectly illustrates the contention that comes as a result of the curse. Okay? Because just as Eve was cursed to desire her husband's position, uh, what was man's part of that? He would rule over her. And what do we see here? Oh man, you, you cannot give them this room because it, it's not just you, king. It's going to go to, to all the officials. It's going to go to all the peoples everywhere. Every woman that is married in this empire is going to look at Queen Bastion and go, oh, she can do it, I can do it. So, oh, great king, you better do something because it'll be chaos. It'll be horror. Do you see the contention here? Do you see the friction? Do you see the panic that, that the counselors have? They're going to get out from under our thumb. we got to keep them there. This is an, a direct result. This, this story, this part right here, is directly connected back to the curse. To that one verse. Your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. And so, the, the, the counsel is strip her of her power. Don't let her be queen anymore. Appoint someone else. Somebody who is going to, to, with proper decorum, be a better queen. Somebody who will be a good example for all the women in our kingdom, in our empire. Get somebody else. So Queen Vashti was stripped of her crown. Uh, some traditions say that she was actually executed. Others say that she was just put off. Um, but, but she was no longer queen. And then we see that the ground is set up for Esther, for Hadassah, to become the queen and to save the people of Israel in the uh, Persian Empire. Okay? But, but this story right here, his response to what is going on inflames the king so that the king has to move, not just on behalf of himself, but on behalf of all men everywhere. Okay? One other thing that I, I want to uh, read to you, this is in the book of Amos, chapter 4, 
Uh, if you would turn there with me, Amos chapter 4. We're in chapter 4, book of Amos. Um, Amos has already spoken forth a number of things uh, about the indulgence, the, the hedonistic lifestyle that the uh, Jews were living. Uh, he comes to uh, chapter 4, verse 1, and he says, Hear this word, you cows of Bashan, who are on the mountains of Samaria who oppress the poor, who crush the needy, who say to your husbands, bring that we may drink. The Lord God has sworn by his holiness that behold, the days are coming upon you when they shall take you away with hooks, even the last of you with fish hooks, and you shall go out through the, the breaches, each one straight ahead, and you shall be cast out into harmony, declares the Lord. Now, up to this point, uh, Amos has been speaking to the nation, uh, genderly, when he speaks of gender, he, he speaks of, of men, but, but he's really speaking to peoples. He actually mentions the peoples. But right here, he changes it. He, he goes, you cows of Bashan. I, you know, there's a lot I don't know. There's a lot that I'm ignorant about. But I do know that it's not a good idea to call a woman a cow. <laughs> I really know it's, it's not a good idea to call a whole group of women cows. Okay? Uh, you don't refer to them as the herd. You don't call them cows. Now, when, when he's speaking here, he's speaking specifically to women, and, and he calls them the cows of Bashan. Now, uh, he is speaking the words of God. Keep in mind that the psalmist also wrote uh, of men, he called them the bulls of Bashan. Now, there's, there's an underlying meaning to this. Uh, if you remember, when Israel came into the Promised Land, uh, they defeated um, Og, the king of Bashan, who was a giant, and they took his land. It was on the east side of the Jordan River. It was an open land. There was a, a lot of fields. It was good for pasture land, and it was very arid. I mean, not arid. It was very uh, fertile, and, and so it was good land. And so when they're talking about the bulls and the cows of Bashan, they're not really saying, calling them a cow like we would think, oh my gosh, he called me a cow. What he's doing is he's trying to illustrate for them, those of you that are living this life of luxury, okay? You have so much, you, have, you, are, you are so being so indulged by your lifestyle that you don't understand what's going on here. And, and it says down here, who say to your husbands, bring that we may drink. Now, I've heard some scholars that said, okay, see, the, the problem here is they're ordering their husbands around. I personally, I don't think that's what's happening. I think the women are telling their husbands, let's party. No, let's, let's get this thing going. Let's do this. Okay? So we see that, that there's this contention that's going on between men and women. But what's, what's significant about this to me is it's the women that are calling the men to be in violation of the commandments of God. It's the women that are saying to the men, hey, come, 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 come on. Bring the booze. Let's party. Let's do this thing. Okay? And so we see that there is this contention. There is a tension that exists in marriage as a direct result of the curse. Okay? Now, I think what the curse did was actually took things and it, it twisted them, okay? I believe the cross and, and the New Testament takes those things that are twisted and starts to bring them around right. But we're so used to everything being twisted that when it starts to look right, we don't understand it. How can this be right? It doesn't look normal. It, it, it's not the way that, that it should be. I, I have had a beard since I was in my 20s. And um, I, I think I've probably shaved my beard off a total of about four times since my 20s. Uh, one day I got up, uh, it was a Saturday, and uh, I had gone into the 
the vanity, our, our bathroom was kind of in three separate parts and I was standing at the sink and I had just shaved and Mackenzie came in and she was about that tall. And she came in and when you're that tall, what do you see of your parents? Their knees. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that's what you see. Which is why so many little kids, when they come up to a group of people, they'll go over and they'll put their arm around somebody's leg that is not their parent. <laughs> and then they go, Okay. That's why, because all knees look pretty much alike. And she had come in and she was kind of holding on to my leg and she was talking with Christy who was over in the other part of the room getting ready for the day and um, I reached down and I picked Mackenzie up and I'm holding her and she's still talking and she, when uh, she was little, I would hold her, she used to reach up and she used to play with my beard, rub my beard. And she kind of reaches over and she does this kind of thing. <laughs> and she turns, and she looks at me, and she goes, I was not her father. <laughs> she, she, she didn't know who this man was. She wanted out of my arms. And even hearing my voice, and knowing it was my voice, and even Christy being in the room telling her it was me, she had a hard time accepting that. So from that moment, I started growing my beard back. I was like, okay, you don't like this? A beard. Okay. So there's this tension that exists. Shaving my face, it was still me. Okay. I, I was still who I was, but it was not what Mackenzie was used to. It was not what she had grown up seeing because from the time she was born until that point, when she was, what, three, four? Yeah. She, she had only ever seen me with a beard. And even though the beard was gone, I was still the same person, but she couldn't, that, that was hard for her to accept, okay? When, when God starts to untangle this mess of how we see this world, the world that is under a curse, the particular culture in which we have grown up in and, and lived our lives in, and, and all of that thing that's just this convoluted, gnarly, horrible mess, um, and he starts to untangle it. Sometimes we, we reject it, we back off, we go, whoa, 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 this does not look right. No, for the first time, it's starting to look right, okay? For the first time, this is starting to look the way it's supposed to, the way it was intended, the way it was designed, okay? So next week, we're gonna, we're gonna leave the part of the curse and we're going to move into what God says in the New Testament about how this whole dynamic is supposed to work. And, and the problem with it now is that it takes work. It's something that is going to take a conscious, willful effort on both partners' part. The husband's going to have to work at it. The wife's going to have to work at it. And guess what? You never get a break because you have to keep working at it. Because ultimately... We're very egocentric and selfish people. Because it's very hard for me to be constantly thinking about Christy throughout the day. My stomach starts to grumble, and I'm not thinking about her anymore other than to say, what's for dinner? Or, you know, um, it's too easy to get caught up in ourselves. So because of sin, the whole dynamic changed. The New Testament comes in. We're under the grace and the mercy of the covenant of the blood of Christ. He's starting to untwist this thing. It doesn't look familiar to us, but I tell you this. If we can implement the principles that he gives us in the New Testament, it works better. Better, better, better. But it's work. It's hard. Because you don't get to just think about yourself anymore. You have to, to prefer someone above yourself. 